why? <clears throat> why are we doing this? Let's set down some um, basic ground rules. Number one, we are not here to discuss faith or to compare faith. This is not an interfaith dialogue. Because, very simply, you cannot discuss faith. You can't discuss it. It's irrational, it's non-negotiable, and therefore not discussable. So I'm not here to tell you what I believe. I'm not here to hear what you believe. Belief is your business. And in a free country, you can believe whatever you want. But we want to know that which can be understood, that which does make sense, that which we can agree on. So there will be no debate as to I believe this, you believe that. That's not the issue. It's rather obvious that people believe whatever they choose to believe. And that's, that's your privilege. The question is, what is the understanding? What is the wisdom, not the faith? So having said that, let's get to some definitions. First of all, what does it mean to believe? What does it mean? A person says, I tell you, for example, that it's raining in Minneapolis. And you say, I believe you. That's not belief. That's not emuna. You believe me that it's raining in Minneapolis because you couldn't care less. It's raining, it's raining. If it's not, it's not. What do you care? That's not emuna. Emuna means something is true to you. You know that it is true, even though you have no way of knowing. You didn't experience it, and you can't explain it. So how can you be so sure that it's true? In fact, when you believe something to be true, you are more confident, you are more convinced, you are more certain of its truth than something you can explain and prove rationally or logically. So when a person says, you know, if you could prove it to me, then I would believe it. No, you wouldn't. You would accept it only on the basis of the proof. If somebody would come along with a counterproof, then you would change your mind. Emuna means you know it to be more true than any proof can possibly make it. What does that mean? Where does that come from? How do you get that? So the simple explanation, without getting too mystical, the simple explanation is this. There are certain events, divine, holy, powerful events, which because of their truth and because of their power engraved itself on our souls for all time to come. So for example, we believe in God. Where did this belief come from? Came from the event at Mount Sinai. We heard God speak to us face to face. And that left such an impression that we and our children and our children's children will always know that there is a God. From proof? No from the impression that God made on our souls. Which means that if God hadn't spoken to us, there is no way that we could have a true belief in him.
It's interesting, uh, interesting piece of history. When we talk about believing in God, we're really not using the right term. Because, let me ask you this question. When in history did we first begin to believe in God? People say, Avraham. Avraham was the first one to believe in God. Well, that can't possibly be true. Noyach didn't believe in God? Noyach was a tzaddik who walked with God. Adam didn't believe in God? The answer is, Adam did not believe in God. Adam spoke to God. So where did belief begin? When did people first start to believe? It began in the days of Enosh when people started to worship idols. Belief began with idols. With an idol, you have to believe. You're never going to have an experience. It's an idol. So Emuna began with idols. God? God we knew. Eventually, when idolatry became very popular and you wanted to discuss with an idolater, the language ended up being, you believe in the idol, I believe in God. But that's not really correct. In an idol, you can only believe. God, we have within us. Adam, because God spoke to him. Noyach, because God spoke to him. And we, because the event at Har Sinai left such an impression on us that we will believe in him forever. Which means we are touched by him forever. We don't always feel it. We can block that feeling, but it's always there. We believe in Torah. How did we get this belief in Torah? We got it at the giving of the Torah. Because we were there, it made such an impression on us that we will never be able to deny the truth of Torah. We believe in tzaddikim, emunas tzaddikim. We believe that what Moshe said was true. And by extension, what Rabbi Akiva said, what the Baal Shem Tov said, where do we get this f belief? Again, at Mount Sinai. As God said to Moshe, I will speak to you, and the people will hear, and they will believe in you forever. So where does true emuna come from? From my choice to believe? Then it's not true emuna. It comes from the fact that the truth of what I believe in made itself known to me. If it's making itself known to me, then all my doubts and all my questions will have no effect. So if I choose to believe in something, then my belief will only be as strong as my stubborn streak. If something true presents itself, shows its truthfulness, then it is as true as it is, not as true as I think it is. Make sense? <clears throat> so how can I be absolutely sure of something? And I don't even have an explanation or proof. The answer is because that something made itself known. And you can't forget something like that. So it's permanent in our soul. However, 
what's permanent in my soul doesn't always enter my mind and heart. So when I allow my soul's certainty to enter my thinking and my heart, that's called emuna. I'm in touch with my own neshama. I'm in touch with what my soul knows. How does it know? Because it was there. It was there when it happened. Now, the obvious question is, we believe the emuna shlema in the coming of Mashiach. How can that be? How can you believe in the coming of Mashiach? You never experienced it. So can you really have true emuna about something that's never happened? Again, we believe in Torah because we were there when it was given. We believe in God because we spoke to him face to face. We believe in Moshe because we experienced Moshe's relationship with God. What about Mashiach? Where do we get the belief in Mashiach? It's a big problem. And yet Rambam says that the belief in Mashiach is as strong and as real as all the things we believe about God and Moshe and Torah. It's one of the 13 principles of faith. But with this question, we will be able to explain another strange, perplexing thing. The only halachic authority on the laws of Rambam, the uh, laws of Mashiach, is the Rambam. But something interesting happens. It is the end, the last two chapters of all 14 volumes of Rambam. And all the volumes, all the laws preceding these two chapters all have a certain style. They follow a style. Rambam says, we are obligated to do such and such. It is a mitzvah to take the Lua of an Esrig on the first night of on the first day of Sukkot. We are commanded to do such and such. It is forbidden to do such and such. That's how you write halacha. It's a book of laws. So you write the laws. You are commanded, it is a mitzvah, it's an obligation, we are instructed, we are prohibited. When it comes to Mashiach, Rambam doesn't say any of that. Rambam does not say it's a mitzvah to believe in Mashiach. Doesn't say it. Rambam doesn't say you are obligated to believe in Mashiach. Rambam says like this, if you don't believe in Mashiach, then you don't believe in the Torah. That's it. Nowhere does Rambam put down a ruling that you are supposed to believe in Mashiach, you have to believe in Mashiach, you're commanded, it's a mitzvah, nothing. The only thing Rambam says is, if you don't believe in Mashiach, then you don't believe in the Torah. Which means, the belief in Mashiach is not a separate belief. You believe in Mashiach because you believe in Torah. And what does Rambam mean, Rambam mean by that? Not because it says in the Torah that Mashiach is coming, therefore you must believe in Mashiach. That's true of everything the Torah says. If you believe in Torah, you believe everything Torah says. The belief of Mashiach is somewhat different. Rambam puts it this way. There are 613 mitzvahs in Torah. Today, because of the Golos, meaning without Mashiach, we are capable of observing only 270 out of 613. 
Therefore, if you believe in Torah, then you believe that the Torah is eternal and that every mitzvah in Torah is eternal and will be observed forever. The fact that we're not doing some mitzvahs today, that's temporary. That's just goes. But we got to get back to doing those mitzvahs, otherwise the Torah is not true. Because temporary is not true. So if those commandments were given only for a short time, then it's not true. And if you argue that maybe that was the whole purpose, it was only necessary for the couple of hundred years when we had a Beis Hamikdash, And without the Beis Hamikdash, those commandments are not necessary. So the Rambam says, there is one commandment in Torah that we've never fulfilled. Building uh, cities of refuge. So certainly, there must come a time when we will fulfill that mitzvah, otherwise it's not true. So if you believe in the truth of Torah, which means that it is eternal, then you have to believe that there will come a time when the goas will end and we will be able to keep all the mitzvahs as it was intended. When is the last time we were able to keep all the mitzvahs? And what are the conditions that make that possible? The last time we were able to keep all the mitzvahs was not with Moshe in the desert, not with Yehoshua fighting wars to inherit the land. It was with David HaMelech. when David finally established some peace in the land through his many battles and inspired all Jews to be good Jews, no idolatry. And he introduced the notion of building the Beis HaMikdash. If you have Jews living in Israel in peace with a Beis HaMikdash, now you can keep all the mitzvahs. Therefore, what do we know about Mashiach? We know that he has to inspire Jews to be Jews. He has to bring peace to the land. And he has to build the Beis Hamikdash. Why those three things? Because that's what it takes to be able to keep all the mitzvahs. So therefore, Rambam says, it's not like a new mitzvah, an additional mitzvah, that you have to believe that somebody is going to come and do magical things. No. You believe in Torah. You believe in everything I've written in the first 14 volumes. Therefore, there must come a time when we will be able to keep all the mitzvahs correctly and as they were intended. And if you don't believe that such a time will come, then you basically don't believe that the Torah is eternal. Or in simple language, if you think that the world as it is today is the way it's going to remain, more or less, then you have basically given up on Torah. Because the Torah says that the world will, because of our mitzvahs, the world will become perfect. If you give up on that notion, you've given up on everything. So the people who say, look, there have always been wars, there will always be wars, get used to it. <coughs> Not kosher. Not kosher. Not because you don't believe in Mashiach, because you don't believe in anything. So, let's put it in different words. The belief in Moshiach is basically the belief in the permanence and eternity of Torah. What do we know about Moshiach? We know that he has to be a descendant of King David, 
because no other king is allowed in Jewish law. So if we're going to have a king, it has to be from Beis David, because God promised David that his family will be the royal family forever. So that's not a matter of belief, that's a halacha. So if somebody comes along and says, I'm going to be your king, and he's not from the house of David, we're not allowed to accept him. Not a matter of belief. Rambam says, you shouldn't think that when Mashiach comes, he's going to have to perform miracles. It's not true, the Rambam says. You shouldn't think that Moshiach is going to have to perform miracles. Again, it's a strange expression. Are we allowed to think it? You're not allowed to think it? What do you mean you shouldn't think? It shouldn't enter your mind. Why? Is it forbidden? What kind of an expression is that? The idea is if, in fact, we believe in Torah, and the Torah says that through the years, through our efforts, through our self-sacrifice, we will make the world godly, and then God will have what he wanted out of creation in the first place. If you believe that, then when Mashiach comes, why would he need to perform a miracle? What is a miracle? A miracle means an, an exception in the laws of nature. That's what a miracle is, right? Why do we need exceptions to the laws of nature? Why do we need miracles? Because nature is not good. Nature is unholy. So there, there will come times, moments, when you have to overrule nature in order to get to the holiness. <coughs> For example, the Jews are trapped by the, by the sea on their way to Mount Torah. Now, what needs to happen, the only thing that needs to happen is Jews have to go to Har Sinai. But nature doesn't allow, because it's a sea. So a miracle happens, and against the nature of water, it splits and stands like a wall, and now what's holy can happen. So when do we need a miracle? If nature is not holy. But if, in fact, through our mitzvahs, through the years, through the sacrifices, we make the world holy, and finally Mashiach comes, why would he need to perform a miracle? Nature will still not be holy? So Rambam says, don't even think that. Here is an interesting example. A king has a, uh, a, a, a hill in a very inconvenient spot in the city. Needs to get rid of this hill. So what does he do? He makes an announcement that there's gold in them hills. And whoever wants can come, borrow tools from the palace, and dig the gold out of the hills and the gold that they find, they can keep. So of course, everybody comes rushing, because that's what happens when you announce that there's gold. You get a rush. So people come rushing for the gold, they take the tools, and they hack, and they clop, and they chop, and they dig, until there's no hill left. But there's no gold. So now the king comes from the palace, with a wagon full of gold, and he gives everyone who dug at, in the hill, he gives them all gold. 
So now they got their gold, he got rid of the hill, everybody's happy. <laughs> Except that it's a dumb plan. If you're going to pay them, tell them, <laughs> tell them up front, get rid of this hill for me, I'll give you gold. What do you have to lie for? And even though in the end everybody's happy, it's not kosher. The king lied. Rambam says, it should not enter your mind that Mashiach is going to perform miracles. Why? Because if you think Mashiach has to perform miracles, then you think that God is like the king with the hill. God said, there is gold in this world. The world of nature, the physical universe, has gold in it. And if you use the tools I give you, which are the mitzvahs, and you dig into this physical universe, you will find the gold. So for 3,000 years, we're hacking and chopping and clapping with the tools, and we're doing the mitzvahs and so on, and then in the end, <laughs> the world is not any better. There's no gold in this world. But God promised you gold, so Moshiach will come, and he will bring gold from heaven, from above nature, from beyond nature. He will perform miracles for the good guys. And then everybody's going to be happy. Yeah, but don't you dare think that God would do something like that. God says that there is gold in nature. All we have to do is bring it out. So in the end, when Mashiach comes, he is going to need to perform a miracle. Nature will still not be cooperating with God. So that's what Rambam means. If you believe in Torah, that Torah is MS, not a gimmick to get you to behave yourself and not a way for God to be able to give you reward from heaven. That's not what Torah is about. Torah means make this world holy because the potential in this world is greater than the potential in heaven. And then in the end you turn around and say, yeah, Mashiach will come, he'll bring us things from heaven. Don't you dare think that. Now, we come to modern times. The Rebbe ruled any number of times that if you want to know anything about Moshiach that is for sure and not conjecture and not belief, look in Rambam. Rambam is the authority, and we need nothing else. There is nothing better. This is the final word. Unfortunately, there is a tendency to replace knowledge with faith. When the Rebbe wanted to make Moshiach real, make Mashiach earthy, like Rambam does. He doesn't ask you to believe. He doesn't expect you to, he doesn't want you to expect miracles. He wants you to see Mashiach as a halachic necessity and a physical inevitability. To exchange that for belief in Mashiach is a step backwards. Remember when, uh, when uh, Yitzchak Rabin was on the, at the lawn of the White House and he shook hands with, um, soon after that we were talking about Moshiach and somebody said to me, so 
you really believe in Mashiach? I said, yes, and I resent it. I hate the fact that I believe in Mashiach. He says, what, what, what does that mean? I said, take a look what's going on. Do I believe in Arafat? No. Arafat, I can shake hands with. Not that I would want to. But Arafat, I can shake hands with. I don't believe in him. But Moshiach can't shake hands with him. So I have to believe that he's coming. I hate that. I'd much rather have it the other way around. I'd much rather shake hands with Mashiach and I'll believe in Arafat, whatever. I'll believe in him for a thousand years. What, 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 Three thousand years. But why must I believe in Mashiach when I can shake hands with Arafat? That's our challenge. Jews have believed in Mashiach for 3,000 years. What did the Rebbe want? That we should believe more? <coughs> no. You can't believe more than you believe. The Rebbe wanted, literally, to stop believing in Mashiach. Because what's the first thing that's going to change when Mashiach comes? The first thing we're going to have to change is that song. Ani mamin bevias hamoshiach. No more. He's here. So the thirteen principles of Rambam will have to change to twelve. So that's what we're looking forward to. We're looking forward to the coming of Mashiach so we can finally stop believing in him. It's not good to believe in Mashiach, because that means that he's not here. <clears throat> the Rebbe's feeling was, God forbid that we should continue to believe in Mashiach for another day. Of course, it's nice to believe in Mashiach. You want a piece of gefilte fish when you get to heaven in Gan Eden? If you believe in Mashiach, you'll get a nice piece of gefilte fish because you're a really good Jew. Maybe even get a little carrot on top. But is that what we want? We just want to be good and believe what we're told to believe and that's enough? I was talking to a very orthodox Jew. And he says, I don't understand what the Rebbe is doing, talking about, making a big tumult about Mashiach. What, he's the only one who believes in Mashiach? We all believe in Mashiach. We've always believed in Mashiach. So in that conversation, I said to him, uh, you know, when Mashiach comes, all Jews will be inspired in Judaism. Can you see that happening in your lifetime? He says, no. When Mashiach comes, all non-Jews will be moral and live in peace. Can you see that happening in the next 50 years? He said, no. The third thing that happens when Mashiach comes is that the earth provides so much wealth, so many resources, that we'll never have to work again, and we'll be able to sit and study. So do you see that happening uh, anytime soon? He says, no. I said, then you have no idea what belief in Mashiach means. Belief in Mashiach means you can taste it. It's so easy. It's so easy. Overnight, overnight, every Jew can suddenly be inspired and want to be Jewish. Overnight. It's so easy. In fact, it is so easy that it's amazing that it didn't happen last night.
What would it take for the whole world to become moral and no more wars? What will it take? It's so easy. One change of attitude, one change in belief, and wars are over. The amazing thing is it didn't happen last night. But could it happen tonight? Of course it could happen. Moshiach can come today. Not I hope he does, I wish he does, I believe he does. You have to be able to see it, to taste it, so that you become impatient. Why isn't it happening? Like the collapse of communism. It's a miracle that it collapsed. No, it's a miracle that it lasted as long as it did. Why didn't it collapse sooner? I don't know, it's a miracle. Why hasn't Mashiach come? There's no good reason. You say, well, you know, because we're not good enough. We can, be, we can become good in a minute. We all want to be good. We're waiting to be good. All we need is someone to get up and say, good, and we'll be good. Who doesn't want to be good? That's a little example. The Pope was in New York a couple of months ago. Remember? Yes, no? He was invited to speak at an Orthodox synagogue. And he went, and he spoke. And the rabbi there thanked him very much and referred to him as your holiness. Somebody said, Oive. <laughs> yes, it is, it is tragic. It's embarrassing. It's degrading. The pope should be invited to a synagogue to an orthodox synagogue, to listen, not to speak. In spite of what he represents, in spite of the evils of the church, he's a nice guy. Comes to New York, invite him to the synagogue so that he'll listen and learn something. The pope comes to your shul, what should you say to him? <laughs> what do you say to a pope? since we are the Jewish people, we are the light to the nations, and Mashiach is late, historically, we got to do something, right? So if the Pope comes to your shul, what should you say to him? Put on film? <laughs> no. You say to him, keep the mitzvahs you're supposed to keep. Get married. <laughs> not, not, not as a criticism. Not as a criticism. As a divine obligation. A non-Jew is obligated to fulfill the mitzvah of be fruitful and multiply. So if you're talking to a guy who's willing to come to your shul, how could you not tell him a halacha that he needs to know? Every shatran in that shul should have approached him. <laughs> I have a girl for you. That would have been so That would have been so proper. And he would have loved it. I'm convinced that he is disappointed. Came to an orthodox shul and nobody taught him anything. They let him babble. Not right. Ima imagine if a rabbi comes to the pope who has influence over 
500 million people? More? 800 million? Imagine if you come to the Pope and you sit him down and you say, listen, wearing a yarmulke is not enough. <laughs> Teach him something. And then he'll pass it on to 800 million people. The world can't become good overnight. Yes, it can. It can. We missed an opportunity. If the Prime Minister of Israel would finally wake up, I don't, I don't mean Sharon. <laughs> the joke in Israel is, Sharon is fine. Olmert is in a coma. <laughs> so if he would wake up and simply say, you know, we can't be any less honest than communists. The communists confessed their sins and said, look, we're an evil institution. We want to, we want to become good. We made a mistake. If he would get up and say, the purpose of the land of Israel is not to export oranges. The purpose of the land of Israel is to export Torah. And from now on, we are going to live by Torah. And we're going to fight wars according to Torah. And we're going to own this land according to Torah. And if you don't understand, we'll explain it to you because we're really good teachers. That wouldn't change the world. You wouldn't have five million Jews suddenly wake up and say, Torah? It can happen in five minutes. <clears throat> the world can produce so much wealth. Just stop using oil. How long does that take? Overnight it can happen. And that's why it's so frustrating when a night goes by and it doesn't happen. That's called bringing Moshiach, not believing in Moshiach. We never want to sing that song again. Ani mamin bevias ha-Moshiach, that's good for concentration camps. Haven't we moved on from there? Have we made no progress? Of course we have. The world is so much better, so much closer, so much more ready that we don't have to believe it. We have to be shocked every night that goes by and it doesn't happen because there's no excuse for it not happening. Now, when we study Rambam, and I remember this back 45 years ago when somebody from Williamsburg, I think it was Satmar or some other group, said, I know why you all like to quote Rambam. I know. Because if you look in Rambam where he describes Moshiach, it sounds like your Rebbe. That's why you like Rambam. So that's very nice to hear. You noticed that the Rambam's description of Moshiach fits the Rebbe very nicely. Which means, if you want to understand what Moshiach is, you want a picture of what Moshiach would look like or what he would do or how he would do it, look at the Rebbe. He is inspiring Jews to come back to Judaism. He is a scholar in all parts of Torah. He is influencing the world. Looks good. Hasidim always said that your Rebbe 
is your Moshiach. And it didn't begin with Hasidim, it began in the times of the Gemara. That every student believed that his Rebbe was his Mashiach. That's correct. Part of the job of a teacher, of a Rebbe, is not merely to give you information. Part of the job is to take you out of your limitations, to take you out of your fear of the nations of the world, and make you feel liberated like Moshe took the Jews out of Egypt, every Rebbe takes his chassidim or his students out of their imprisonment, out of their golos, out of their fear or intimidation of the world, from the world. Any chassid in Russia under Stalin who refused to go to work on Shabbos, he was taken out of golos. Because everybody in Russia said, you can't. You can't keep Shabbos. It's impossible. You have to go to work on Shabbos under Stalin. The chassid who refused to go to work was not in Golis. Stalin didn't own him. Who took him out of his Golis? His Rebbe. So to him, the Rebbe was his Moshiach. And that's the way it ought to be. When the Rebbe came around, and the similarity between what Rambam describes and what the Rebbe was doing was very striking, so people said, maybe the Rebbe is not just our Mashiach, maybe he is the Mashiach. Melech HaMashiach. Because every generation has a candidate who might be Mashiach. So if you had to pick somebody, who do you call? Who would you pick? But nowhere ever was it said or claimed that our Rebbe, previous Rebbe, Al Shemtev, Whoever you, however far you, back you want to go, no one ever claimed that a certain person was the Mashiach. Rabbi Akiva insisted that Bar Kochba was Mashiach. But when it turned out that he was killed, then he realized that he wasn't. Not that he wasn't a good candidate. Maybe he blamed it on the times. The people weren't ready. But it turned out that he wasn't. The, the Hasidic concept of Moshiach of the generation is a very reasonable and correct and necessary uh, principle. Because if we're going to come out of Golis collectively, it has to happen individually. The more individuals who are out of Golis, the closer we are to the big event when we all come out of Golis. So if every Rebbe is effectively, successfully, the Mashiach of his Chassidim and his Talmidim, then collectively we become ready for Melech HaMashiach, the real thing. When we say the Mashiach of a generation, what we mean is not just that I think he's Mashiach because he was good to me. <coughs> just a simple example. In the Rebbe's times, and there's no question that Rebbe is the Mashiach of our generation. In the Rebbe's times, what um, Geula event developed that wasn't there before? What step towards Geula did the Rebbe bring about? 
a very significant one. In the Rebbe's lifetime, Judaism was in exile. Judaism was in Golis. Because in Russia, you were not allowed to keep Shabbos. You were not allowed to make a bris. You were not allowed to teach your children olive beans. Torah was in Golis. And all other communist countries as well. But during the Rebbe's lifetime, that ended. For the first time in 2,000 years, there is not a country in the world that suppresses Yiddishkeit. There's still anti-Semitism. They still don't like Jews, but they would never deny you your Judaism. It's just not acceptable anymore. That is a huge step. Judaism came out of Golis. We have to thank the Rebbe for that. How did that happen? To a, a large, to a large extent, the Rebbe started a tefillin campaign. You know what a tefillin campaign means? A tefillin campaign means Jews got over their embarrassment and started putting on tefillin in the streets. That's a tefillin campaign. The Rebbe wasn't simply asking everybody to be more religious. We've been religious. Our grandparents and great-grandparents were more religious than, we, than we're going to be. What the Rebbe wanted is to take us out of Golos in the sense of, why are you ashamed of your tefillin? Stop it. Put on the tefillin in the street in front of your non-Jewish friends and inspire them. What are you ashamed of? And the same with the Lul of the Esra. Walk down the streets with your Lul of an Esra again, shake it in everybody's face. What are you ashamed of? By doing that within the Jewish community, it affected the rest of the world. You can't hide people's Judaism. You can't oppress people's Yiddishkeit. And the next thing you know, President Putin is lighting the menorah in front of the Kremlin. That's a miracle like, like the coming out of Egypt. Pharaoh wouldn't let the Jews go, and all of a sudden he let them go. Russia wouldn't let Jews out, all of a sudden they're letting Jews out. But Pharaoh never lit them and them. The Egyptian army never marched in front of a Lagboba parade like the Russian army band does. In that sense, we came out of Golis, a giant step. Another thing happened in the Rebbe's lifetime. For the first time in 2,000 years, Jews are not afraid to speak up. If we're upset about something, we scream. We protest. So we haven't really healed completely, but we've come a long way. On the other hand, <clears throat> We are in Golis. We are deeply, seriously in Golis. We are faced with a bigger, a bigger threat today from Iran, God forbid. It's a bigger threat than we've had in hundreds of years. So the discussion whether the Rebbe is Moshiach or not is really an emotional issue. It has no merit because Moshiach is not here. It's not like Moshiach came and we're not sure who it is. And some say it's the Rebbe, some say it's not. Moshiach is not here. 
So what is the debate? We are in Golis. Why are we arguing about who took us out? We're not out. No one took us out yet. So what is the question? Who will be Moshiach? Now we're making predictions of the future? Speculating? If you want to speculate, goes into the hate. But then we're not being serious. So, factually, halachically, for all practical purposes, there is no Mashiach. We're still believing that he will come. That's the tragic side. We were having this debate at Beis Chana, 30 teenagers. And somebody brought up the question, the Rebbe Mashiach, and somebody said yes, somebody said no, and they started arguing and screaming. And there was one girl sitting there who had never heard the word Mashiach before. Somebody had to translate it for her. The Messiah. So she says, excuse me, but you're arguing about who is Mashiach? What's the difference? Suppose he is, suppose the rabbi, she didn't, know, she didn't even know who we were talking about. So suppose this rabbi is Mashiach. We would do what? And if he's not Mashiach, we would do what? She said, what's the difference? What are you arguing about? It's, I mean, lahavdul. It's like people sitting around saying, who was the greatest center fielder in history? And they said, Mickey Mantle. No, Willie Mays. What's the difference? You think Mickey Mantle, Mickey Mantle. You think Willie Mays, Willie Mays. What are you arguing about? There's no practical difference. If the Rebbe is Mashiach, we still need to be good. We still need to be doing mitzvahs. We still need to bring the world up a few rungs. And if he's not Mashiach, then we certainly need to bring the world up. So what is the difference? Is it reassuring to think that you know who Mashiach is? Or will be soon? If it's reassuring, gesundheit, hate. Whatever works. But you can't make a policy out of it. You certainly can't say that Hasidim believe that the Rebbe is Mashiach. That's not, that's not correct. Hasidim believe that the Rebbe is their Moshiach. Or in our case, since the Rebbe was responsible for the whole world, he is the world's Moshiach of this generation. Melech HaMoshiach hasn't arrived yet. What are we arguing about? Two things we need to know. Number one, in order for Mashiach to come in the physical, he first has to come in Torah. Because everything comes into this world through Torah. So if the Torah says that Mashiach is here, halachically, that brings Mashiach down to where he can now come into this world. If according to Torah, Mashiach hasn't come, then there's no way Mashiach can come in the physical. What does it mean that Torah decides? Rambam says that Mashiach comes when we do tshuva. Which means that if we haven't done tshuva, then even according to Torah, Mashiach is not here. Not just in fact, in principle he's not here. He can't be here. We haven't done tshuva. If the Torah should then rule that we have done tshuva, then the Torah has brought Mashiach down into the halacha, into the world of Torah. And from there, the next step is bring him from Torah into the world. So when the Rebbe would say, Mashiach is here already, Mashiach is overdue. Why is, he, why is he still hiding? He's supposed to be here. What he's 
What the Rebbe was saying is that according to Torah, Mashiach has already come. We have done tshuva, we've polished our buttons, we have met the requirements, Torah's requirements for Mashiach. And therefore, according to Torah, Mashiach can now come. And when Mashiach didn't come, the Rebbe was upset. Now what? So all those talks where the Rebbe says Mashiach is here, open your eyes and you'll see, and Mashiach is overdue, and it's kol kolakitzim, and we've already done tshuva, that was the Rebbe's Torah ruling that brings Mashiach down into Torah. So al Torah, Mashiach already came. Now we need him to come according to our experience. Like somebody once said to a rabbi, I forget who it was, so what if Mashiach comes and I don't accept him? The rabbi said, if Mashiach comes and you don't accept him, then he's not Mashiach. Mashiach means the person that everyone recognizes as Mashiach. If you don't recognize him, he's a very nice guy, but he's not Mashiach. Which means, if Mashiach can't be recognized by the average man in the street, then he is still in heaven. He hasn't come down. So when the Rebbe said, open your eyes and you will see that Mashiach is here. If we were honest, like Chassidim are supposed to be, we would immediately write a note to the Rebbe. I opened my eyes and I don't see so Moshiach is not here. The fact that the Rebbe sees him means that Moshiach is there, not here. We don't want Moshiach to be there. We want him to be here, and he's not here. And we weren't honest enough to say that. We weren't honest enough to demand of the Rebbe, what do you mean, open your eyes and see? We opened our eyes. We see horrors. We see rockets landing in Israel every day. What are we seeing? But we played this game with the Rebbe. He said, open your eyes and you'll see. And we said, yeah, right. Right what? What? Who are we fooling? <clears throat> It's like Moshe was upset with the people in his days because God said, after the giving of the Torah, the Jews were so inspired, God said, Mi yitain. Who could give them this feeling forever? And Moshe waited for the Jews to respond, and they didn't. Moshe was angry at them for 40 years. And he said to them, when God said, Mi yitain, who could make you feel this way forever? Why didn't you say to God, you? You make us feel this way. What did you think? Suffering is going to make you feel this way? Why didn't you say? Why weren't we honest? That's number one. Number two. Anyone who, who, who has any appreciation for what the Rebbe, the character that the Rebbe had, would know immediately without a shadow of a doubt that when the Rebbe said, Moshiach's name is Menachem, there's no way in the world that the Rebbe could possibly have thought of himself. It's, anyone who knew the Rebbe even a little bit would know that that is an impossibility. The Medrash says that Moshiach's name is Menachem, and it's a very nice name. That the Rebbe would think that since his name is Menachem, therefore he is Moshiach, it's impossible. My name is also Menachem.
מי בים משיח? Particularly, who was more bothered? Who hurt more? Who suffered more by the fact that Moshiach was not here and that Jews were still suffering than the Lubavitcher Rebbe? So on the one hand, he is suffering, literally getting sick, I mean literally, because Moshiach is not here and Jews are suffering. And at the same time, he's thinking, hey, I'm Moshiach. It's, a, it's impossible. It's an insult to the Rebbe to even suggest such a thing. Therefore, our conclusion is this. We are in Golis. Moshiach is not here. Who is going to be Moshiach when he comes? None of your business. We are not into speculating. We're not into predicting the future. We're not fortune tellers. That is not Jewish. And that's why Rambam says, don't waste your time trying to figure out when and how and who. That's not the point. The point is, he must come. Because the world has to become what God wants it to be. If we can do anything to make the world a little bit more like what God wants it to be, that is the fulfillment of our entire obligation to Torah, to God, and to Moshiach. If we don't teach the world that is today desperate for Torah knowledge, I'm not going to go into this because this is not the topic, but if you knew how desperate the world is to know Torah, I'm talking about the Muslim world. If any idea how millions of Muslims are desperate to know what God is really all about, because the God they're given is not acceptable to them. Mayor Kahana was in Minnesota shortly before he got killed. And he was running for office. He was running for prime minister. So I said to him, only half jokingly, I said to him, why do you want to be a prime minister? We've had prime ministers. As soon as you get on that chair, you lose it. So what good, what good will it be if you're the prime minister? On the other hand, if you became the chief rabbi to the Arabs, <laughs> and you would teach them what they need to know from Torah, They'll, they would worship you. They would kiss your feet. They would. And they would understand you, because you speak their language. If you became their rabbi, you could change the world. We would have peace in the Middle East. In fact, they would find out that we need to build a Beis Hamikdash on the Temple Mount, they would take down the mosque. And that's how it's going to happen. Not through a bomb, not through an earthquake. They're going to take it down so that we can build a base on English. Because when Mashiach comes, nature will not resist godliness. So if we can do that a little bit, if we can move the world a step closer, one mitzvah closer, even for non-Jews. We're going to have something really incredible. I mean, we talk about the Rebbe's greatness and the Rebbe's power and the Rebbe's holiness. You want, to, you want to see something really unbelievably great? There was a, a guy from Israel, a member of Knesset, from the opposition, who was sitting with the Rebbe, bad-mouthing the government. And one of the things that Rebbe said, the, the guy said to the Rebbe is, we are so crazy. We are such an insa insane society. We pay every Arab woman, every Palestinian woman who has a baby, we pay them a monthly check for that baby. What, are we crazy? And the Rebbe said, no, 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 no. Having a baby is a mitzvah. 
if they're doing a mitzvah, we should help them. Because this kid is going to grow up, we're going to have to shoot him. That's a bazunda. That's another mitzvah. <laughs> One mitzvah at a time. Of course, hopefully, the kid will grow up and not. But when a, when a, when a non-Jew is doing a mitzvah, you have to help him. What's going to be later? That's God's business. You got to do the mitzvah. See, that kind of thinking is what the Rebbe expects of us. The reality of the world is the reality of Torah. We've got to get that through our heads. There is no other reality. And we have that information. It, it, it bothers me. There are so many rabbis who are great speakers. They love to speak. They love to be in public. They love to be heard. They love to be seen. They think they're really great. Why are they not on television? Why? All of a sudden, they're bashful. They give these great sermons. Their congregations are inspired and, and impressed. Do the same thing on television. Let everybody hear. There isn't a single rabbi on national television. Hmm? That's what happens when the real rabbis won't go. So why not? Why not? OK. Orthodox rabbis are not on television because they don't believe in television. Because supposedly their congregation doesn't have televisions. <laughs> you know, now with the flat screens. <laughs> but where are the conservative rabbis? Why are they afraid to be on television? What are they ashamed of? Why won't they share their message with the world? We got to get over this inferiority complex. Like in that story, the two Jews who were being shot, one of them shouted, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. We've learned to shout. When we don't like something, we shout which is a giant step in our healing process after a Holocaust. But what do we shout? Democracy, equality. When are we going to learn to shout Shema Yisrael? The world doesn't need to learn democracy from us. From us, the world needs to hear Shema Yisrael. There is one reality, and that's the Torah. Every word of it, every mitzvah, that's the reality of this world. This is what the Rebbe taught us for 40 years in a hundred volumes, tirelessly, patiently, logically, convincingly, and repeatedly. Rebbe once complained, why do I have to spell everything out? In the olden days, people got it, you know, with, without lengthy explanations. It was painful for him to have to spell everything out, but he did. To take all of that and dismiss it and say, I believe he's Moshiach, th this is not nice. The Rebbe deserves better than that. The Rebbe when the Russians started coming out in large numbers, the Rebbe instituted a minhag, a custom, of whistling at a fabrengen. You ever hear? The Rebbe would motion for people to whistle, and the whistling was deafening. 
the Rebbe heard that somebody asked one of his chassidim, what is this? Whistling? That's not even Jewish. <coughs> Who ever heard of whistling? So the chassid said to this, he said, by us, we don't question a Rebbe. If the Rebbe says whistle, we whistle. This got back to the Rebbe. The Rebbe was so angry. By the next Fabrengen, he was beside himself. He was offended. Somebody asked you a question. How could the Rebbe start this very un-Jewish custom of whistling? And all you could say is, he does whatever he wants. We don't question him. The Rebbe said, this is the result of my talking to you for hour after hour after hour for 40 years. All you can come up with is, yeah, he does whatever he wants. The Rebbe was so offended. So why do I sit here and talk to you for hours and hours about Fabrenians and explain things and show you where I got it from, which Gemara it comes from, which Halacha it is? And then you turn around and say, I don't know, he does what he wants. That's it? So the Rebbe taught us, the Rebbe made us, formed us, shaped us into Moshiach Dika people, not believers in Moshiach. People who could understand, see the world the way it's going to be when Mashiach comes. Taste it, imagine it, expect it. And we turn around and we say, we have lots of emunah. Thank you very much. You're going backwards. Your grandfather had more emunah. That's not what we need. We need to bring Mashiach down to earth. By saying the Rebbe is Mashiach, you're making Mashiach so mysterious and so complex and so otherworldly that you're, you're, you're setting us back 200 years. So, is the Rebbe Mashiach? There never was and there is not today any such belief. Siddim say the Rebbe is the Mashiach of our generation as the Friedrich Rebbe was in his generation, as the Alter Rebbe was in his generation, and as Rabbi Akiva was in his generation. Rabbi Akiva thought Bar Kochba was Mashiach. <laughs> Anybody could have told him, hey, Rabbi Akiva, it's you. You are the Mashiach of our generation. But he didn't see it. He saw it in Bar Kochba. So, absolutely, the Rebbe was and is the Mashiach of our generation. And he made it possible for Judaism to come out of Golis. And he made it possible for Jews to put on tefillin in public, in the, in the airport. I was in the airport recently. I left the house very early. It was too early to daven. So now I'm thinking, should I daven here in the airport or wait till I get to where I'm going? Davening in the airport, you put on the towers, you make a whole scene, you put on your tefillin, the, the, the security guards come running over, like, what are you strapping on? <laughs> and you say it's a religious thing, they go altogether crazy. <laughs> so what am I going to make a scene for? I figure I'll, I'll daven when I get to where I'm going. Just then, right in front of my eyes, a guy reaches into his bag and pulls out a little rug, a little carpet. And he lays it down right in front of a Coke machine. <laughs> and he gets down on his hands and knees and his forehead on the floor. I said, that's it, I'm putting on my floor. <laughs> if this guy can pray to a Coke machine. <laughs> and he's not ashamed. They never made it possible for Jews to come out of hiding. That's a huge step coming out of Golis. And that's what the Medrash says. Medrash makes an interesting comment. At the beginning of creation, God told 
the souls and the angels what's going to be. The angel of death heard, the Satan, heard that Moshiach is going to come and Satan will be out of a job. So the Satan said to God, who is this Moshiach? How is he going to put me out of business? The first thing that God said about Moshiach, what would you think? The first thing in describing Moshiach, you would think, the first thing, he's going to be brilliant. He's going to be holier than holy. God said, you want to know who Mashiach is? Magbiya Kaimosai. He stands up straight. Magbiya Kaimas And he gets the people of his generation to stand up straight. Then he goes into a whole thing. No enemy will be able to stand up against him. He will to conquer the whole world. But the first thing, he stands up straight. From this we learn that good posture is very important. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing Mashiach has to do is take us out of Golas, out of our Golas, not to convince the Russians to let us go, to convince us that we have some place to go. So the first thing is, we have to be able to stand up straight after being bowed and hunched for 2,000 years. Who did that for us after the Holocaust? Who enabled Jews to stand up straight? The Rebbe. He stood up straight. In fact, my attraction to Lubavitch when I was a kid living in Crown Heights. There were Bubavar and there were Satmar and there were Litvish and every, every Jewish group was there in Crown Heights. And then there was 770. And the difference was everybody else walked around stooped. You could feel it. There was a dark cloud hanging over the Jewish world. We were destroyed, it was over, a couple of religious guys still hanging around. When they die, it's finished. Then I walk into 770. <laughs> it was very strange. There were maybe 40 Hasidim, 40, in a Fabrengen. And the Rebbe is speaking to these 40 Hasidim. None of them speak English. Very few of them are under 60. And the Rebbe says to them, we're going to change the world. Who's we? <laughs> <laughs> and he never let up. That's called standing up straight. So the Rebbe took Judaism out of Golis by defeating communism. And he defeated it without firing a shot, without claiming any credit, all behind the scenes. And when communism collapsed, there are no countries that would dare to forbid the practice of Judaism, first time in 2,000 years. And for the first time in 2,000 years, some Jews are starting to shout, Shema Yisrael. We need a, for, a few more Jews who will shout Shema Yisrael, knowing that the world desperately needs to hear it and that that is our mission. Then we won't have to believe in Mashiach. He will be here. It'll be real. We'll be able to open our eyes and really see not convince ourselves that we're seeing. And now, although I promised I wouldn't talk about my beliefs or your beliefs, just on a personal note, do I want the Rebbe to be Mashiach? No. I don't want to share him with the whole world. 
I want him to be in 770. We'll come to a Fabengen. It'll be crowded a little bit. You push a little bit, but it's manageable. If he becomes Mashiach, <laughs> will he still talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> so personally, I'm not so excited about his being Mashiach. And uh, by the way, the job is not such an, uh, it's a very difficult job. If it ever worked hard enough, let somebody else be Mashiach. It's a painful job. So, let's do what the Rebbe really wanted, to which there is no doubt. Let's bring Mashiach, not believe in him. And by bringing him, then we will have the Rebbe come back like all tzaddikim, like all Jews. The world will be perfect. And then... If he wants to be Mashiach, let him be Mashiach. He doesn't want, I'm fine with that. <laughs> if Menachem Begin wants to be Mashiach. <laughs> and if his name is not Menachem, I don't care either. And if he wants to come on Shabbos, even though he's not supposed to come on, I don't care either. And if the donkey never shows up, that's fine too. <laughs> what are we hung up on these things for? We're talking about a universal, global <coughs> godliness. And we're going to quibble about whether it's going to be a white donkey or not. That's what Rambam says. Believe in Torah. Everything else falls into place. How do you believe in Torah? It's in you. You don't have to make up a belief. When Mashiach comes, we should all be able to say to Mashiach, I did my part. I didn't just hang around waiting for you to come. I did my part. I participated in making it happen. And that's called greeting Mashiach. Because if you don't do anything to bring him, you're going to be too ashamed to greet him. So we shouldn't be ashamed. This is what the Rebbe wanted. Of course, Mashiach will come with or without us. We prefer that he come with us, not in spite of us. And that's what motivates us to do everything we can to make the world a little bit better. going into the month of Av, it becomes particularly important because it's a miserable month and we got to make it, we got to make it into a good month. So hopefully this will be the first time that we do not fast on Tisha B'Av because Gullus will be over, Geula will have commenced and every bad memory will become a joy. Thank you very much for listening. What did the Murphy mean when he said, open your eyes and see the shit? Now, I'll tell you why we didn't ask. Because you were afraid to get very angry and tell us, I've been talking for 40 years, you haven't heard anything I said. How come, you know? I mean, we're afraid of being like, what do you mean you don't understand what I'm talking about? But I promise I won't do that. Okay. <laughs> What, to the best, do you can understand? How would you explain it to us? Okay. Number one, when the Rebbe made statements about, about any subject in the world, it was never speculation. It was never disconnected from immediate reality. For example, when the previous Rebbe said, we are going through the birth pangs of Mashiach. Was that a prediction? Was that a nevuah? What was that? It was simply an explanation of current events. People saw a holocaust and they said, what in the world is this? So the Rebbe said, this is the birth pangs of Mashiach. It was not a prediction, it was not a nevuah. It was an explanation. 
When the Rebbe said, open your eyes and see Moshiach, what he meant to say was, there are events happening in the world that can only be explained by the closeness of Moshiach. Like, the Rebbe pointed out, the collapse of communism. So there were messianic developments that if you opened your eyes, you would see it. So the Rebbe wasn't making predictions, and it wasn't the Navua, and it wasn't mysticism. It was current events. Do you understand what your eye is seeing? You're seeing something Mashiach did. Now, the Rebbe didn't say that about the Six-Day War. The Rebbe spoke endlessly about the miracle of it and the, ma and the magnificence, and the but he never said it was Mashiach, because it wasn't. It was simply another miracle of Jewish survival in Golis. We've had many such miracles. So it was another Hanukkah story. It was another Purim story. The few beat up the many. It's not Mashiach. But the collapse of communism, Mashiach. So open your eyes and see what's Mashiach dik and what's more Golis. The problem is, of course, we saw the collapse of communism. We saw them take down the Berlin Wall. We saw Yiddishkeit come out of Golis. And then we saw a lot of bad stuff. So we should have said to the Rebbe, it's nice, but not good enough. That's the simple pshat, I mean, the simple. And to say the Rebbe was giving a prophecy, a nevua, what? That wasn't the Rebbe's style. I'm curious about the musical aspect. <laughs> you mentioned when the Mashiach comes, one of the first things that will happen, we'll stop singing that song. I'm curious about the other song that has been sung, at least since the 80s, probably earlier. Yechi Adonenu, Moreno Rabbeinu, Hamelech HaMashiach, Bolova. Not Mashiach for our generation. When people sing that song, we can understand that you, we would say they never meant that they referred to Rabbi Menachem Schneerson. Or now, would you say that they, anybody who thinks that should be told that they're wrong in thinking that? Thank you. The Rebbe said, if you sing that song, I'm going to walk out. And you know what happened? They sang it again. I can't get over that. I can't, I, that that's like. No, in fact, the Rebbe said, I should walk out. And I'm not going to walk out because it's not going to help anyway. And sure enough, next week, they sang it again. So it's not a happy development. You come to the microphone. We can speak up. After how many years we can speak up? Firstly, I should laugh, and I would say, just for whatever it's worth, personally, I agree with, I think, at least 80% of what you said. Um, to set the record straight, when was that episode that happened, and what was the song that was sung? Just for the sake of accuracy for the record. It was an Israeli version of the Rebbe being Mashiach. So it wasn't the song that you had the name? No, it was the suggestion that the Rebbe is Mashiach. Okay. So the Rebbe it? said, I'm going to walk out because I object to this. The Rebbe said many times, this is turning people away from Hasidus, and we're not allowed to do he it. He said this then? I think so. No, it was Parshas Noyach Tavshin Nun Beis. The Rebbe did not say, he said that um, he would walk out, and it was that song that they sung, and it's the same song that was sung on Shabbos Reishas Tavshin Ben Hey, but never did the Rebbe stop or protest the singing of Yechi Adineinu Mereinu Rabbeinu Melech HaMashiach Leilam Poet. Just for the sake of accuracy. A uh, couple of questions. If you allow me, let me ask the four questions then you could um, try to remember them. Yes. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that the Rebbe would never refer to himself by quoting the Menachem Shemoy. Um, how do you explain the Rebbe's footnote that 770 
the address is the gematria base Moshiach. That's one. Another one, Parshas Mishpatim Tovshin Nun Aleph. The Rebbe said the Moshiach has already been appointed, which I understand to be different than the Moshiach of every generation, which traditionally we, of course, have. He's already been appointed, and all that is lacking now is Kabbalah's Malchusoi Al Yudei Ha'am, the acceptance of his sovereignty through the people. And one more point, on Parshas Mishpatim Tovshin Nun Beis, which I have over here, uh, excerpts of edited Sichas of the Rebbe, Surah Sagiullah. There the Rebbe says that the Rashi Tevis, the acronym of the word Miyad, which he uses so often, um, referring to Mashiach coming, quoting from the Rambam and other sources, that it's going to be immediate, Miyad. So at this point, the Rebbe says that the Rashi Tevis of Miyad refers to the three periods, the three eras of the leadership of, as the Rebbe always says, the Rebbe de Shver Nesidei Reinu, my father-in-law, referring to the Rebbe Rayatz, Ve'al Seder Hakir Va'eleinu, and in order of closeness to us, Mem stands for Moshiach, in parentheses, Menachem Shemoy. The Yud stands for Yosef Yitzchak, the two names of his father-in-law, his predecessor. Dalit stands for Doiv Ber, as the Rebbe says, the second name of the Rebbe before that, the Rebbe Rashad. And then the Rebbe goes on and says, in all the Pirushim of Mamish, Mem, Mem, Shin. The Rebbe says, Miyad stands for Moshiach and the Friedrich Rebbe and his father. And that shows what? Nothing. That after the Friedrich Rebbe, Moshiach comes. Or should come. All of these things, if you want to use a little imagination, yeah, you can translate it to mean the Rebbe. But to say that that's what the Rebbe said? No, he didn't. So all of these things, they're tantalizing little hints that can be, but anybody who says the Rebbe claimed to be Moshiach is way out of line. No matter how much we want to believe that he's Moshiach, to say that he said it, that's, that's blasphemous. Because the Rebbe was horrified by that for 40 years. So people come along and say, yes, for 40 years he objected, but then something changed. What changed? He said that the word miyad, or he said the other little hints that this is how you pronounce yourself Mashiach. This is how you announce that Mashiach is here? By dropping a little footnote that says Miyad? Come on. In fact, I was talking to Lahavdul. I was talking to a, uh, a, a, a missionary, a Christian missionary. He was Jewish, Aftzalachas. But he had all the lines, all the things, all the arguments. So he said, tell me, what did Yashke do that made the Jews reject him? What did he do? It's nice when they're a little defensive, at least, you know? Like, maybe he did something. What did he do? I said, nothing. Nothing he did and nothing he said turned Jews off. What turned Jews off was when he was born and people said he is Moshiach because of the stars. We got turned off by that. What are we, playing little games? Ooh, the star, it was shining, so he must be Moshiach. That's how you recognize Moshiach. The, the people argue that the Rebbe said that the Friedrich Rebbe was Moshiach. So there, even after the Friedrich Rebbe passed away. So we see from this you can... Did the Rebbe say that the previous Rebbe was Melech HaMashiach? That's absurd. Why? Because if the Rebbe really felt back in the, in the, in the, in the 30s, in the, in, the, in the 50s, that the, that the Friedrich Rebbe was Moshiach, you would never hear the end of it. If he really thought this is Melech HaMashiach, 
you wouldn't have tefillin campaigns. You would have Moshiach campaigns. Moshiach is here, and nobody knows it. He would spend his days and nights. He mentions it twice or three times, and that's it. What kind of business is this? And then the contradictions. Oh, the Rebbe said that the Friedrich Rebbe is Melech Moshiach. Yeah, but then he also said that after the Friedrich Rebbe, then comes Moshiach. Mashiach of the generation. That's, that's kosher. The Rebbe never objected to that. But Melech HaMashiach? Where do you see Melech HaMashiach? We're in such a miserable goes. Worse now than before. Israel would never have spoken publicly about giving away Yerushalayim. Now they do. So where? What are we seeing? Yeah. I was just curious how you would address the issue that um Mal Hoshia can act on for some of them for the summer instead. Is that if there's some rival because they're not looking? Right. Now we get into a whole new can of worms. Once we decide that the Rebbe is Moshiach, then when the Rebbe passes away, ooh, we got a big problem. So now we develop all sorts of new Emunah systems. One Emunah system says, the Rebbe didn't pass away. Oh, but he did. No, I don't believe he did. So now we've got a new Emunah. Where did we get this emuna from? It fits. It suits the purpose. So we have a new thing to believe now. And of course, the belief that the Rebbe is Moshiach is responsible for that kind of thinking. Where people will not write the Rebbe's name because they don't want to have to write Zatzal after it. Come on, this is, this is it's very, it's very not nice. The Rebbe deserves better. So, if, uh, if we start making, some guy actually said to me, he said, why can't you believe that, the, that the, the, there was no, there was no uh, histalkos, and the Rebbe didn't pass away? Why can't you believe that, why can't you believe? Since when do we do that? Hey, maybe we can believe this. Maybe we can believe that. This is not kosher. There are things we're supposed to believe. Everything else is not kosher. There are laws to emuna. So then people run around saying shlita. Very nice. You're a big chassid. I'm very impressed. It's not nice. It's not nice. Again, the Rebbe deserves better. So, for all of the above reasons, and primarily because we don't need to do this, there's no need for this. It doesn't make the world any better. It doesn't make anyone better. We don't need this. The main thing is, when the Rebbe said not to say this, he gave a reason. He said, because it turns people away from studying Hasidus. Now, if you could demonstrate that something has changed, and today, when we tell the world that the Rebbe is Moshiach, it doesn't turn them away from studying Hasidus, then I would say, maybe you're onto something. The fact is, it's turning people away terribly. So the reason that Rebbe gave is still valid. So how can you ignore it? Yeah. Um, I wanted to thank you for coming. I owe you personally a tremendous support to tell um, a study of based comments. So I'm sort of one of your telling you. Um, my question for you is more talkless. It has to do with, I've heard said through the years that the Rebbe said that he had done everything that he could do and the rest was up to us. And I was wondering if you could just elucidate that a little bit in 
also these arguments, and, and actually one of the people that you were talking about, I never knew that the Rebbe actually said that it turns people away. Um, I've always had kind of a wall between myself and Chabad, and I've always loved, I always felt very close to the Rebbe, but as these developments took place over the years, I kind of distanced myself from Chabad, and it's been a very painful thing because I just I felt myself in tears this evening listening to you talk and all the things that I thought over the years um, was very enlightening to me and kind of opened my heart um, knowing that when I sat in your classes 20 years ago that I wasn't imagining things, the things that I was learning and how beautiful and amazing they were and that um, but particularly what turns me away is that not just what these discussions, but also particularly after the Revolution, or that I'm a convert from Christianity, and so that made me feel particularly uncomfortable. And I don't want to cause my focus within the community, so I tend not to ask um, people in Chabad these questions because I know that they're very um, charged. <laughs> but, um, but that one idea of I think it's very topless for everybody since we've seen today this minute don't have the Rebbe or Mashiach. What is it that's left for us to do that he had done everything that he could do? What was everything that he could do and what did he need to do? Okay. I want to make one thing very, very clear. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> And I can tell you this with absolute certainty. I have no idea. I have no idea what the Rebbe meant when he said, I've done everything I can do. I have no idea what that means. Particularly since after he said that, he continued to work as hard as ever and didn't wait to see what we do. So I have no idea what, what the Rebbe meant by that. I have no idea what we're, why we should be expecting. I have no idea what, what to make of the condition that we're in without a Rebbe. I have no idea. But it's not fashionable anymore to say I don't know. You know why? Why say you don't know when you can make up an idea that answers the question. What's wrong with believing that the Rebbe never passed away? What's wrong with believing that Mashiach can come from the dead? What's wrong with... I, I don't know. I don't know. And the truth is, none of us know. We don't know. Mashiach is as mysterious as ever. For a while, we thought we had it. The Rebbe was doing his thing. It was going along wonderfully. It looked like the real thing. Now it's mysterious again. God is, God is up to his funny ways again. So I don't know. And saying I don't know is not humility. I just don't know. And uh, when you don't know, you have to say, I don't know. So what did the Rebbe mean when he said, Miyad, what did he mean when he said, I, I don't know. To guess and to say he meant himself and he meant that he's Moshiach, and, but he was upset when you said he was Moshiach, but then the times changed, and now we can say it, we can sing it, we can dance it. I don't know. I don't know. It's turning people away from Chassidus. And the one thing I know for sure is that's not our job. It is not our job to turn people away from chassidus. It's our job to bring people into chassidus. That's for sure. Beyond that, we're in big trouble. <laughs> we're in a big mess. And uh, there's no way around that. And it's not, it's not embarrassing to say I don't know because we're talking about mysterious subjects. So if somebody says to me, so how come Mashiach hasn't come yet? Right. You expect me to answer that question? 
So how come the Rebbe passed away and there's no Rebbe? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you. It's, it's, it's because uh, yeah, I got it all figured out. It's, I don't know. I don't know. And when we don't know, then we have to become even more careful and devoted to what we do know. That's when you really have to hold on to the definites, because the maybes can, can destroy us. So no more guessing, no more philosophizing, no more theorizing. Did the Rebbe mean this or did the Rebbe mean that? If we're not sure what he meant, move on. Go to what you know for sure. And what we know for sure is that spreading Hasidus brings Mashiach. We don't know of any other way. So people who say, oh, the Rebbe said that we should bring Mashiach. Oh, there's some other way? Not through tzedakah? Not through spreading Hasidus? Not through tshuva? There is no other way. So let's go back to the definites, to the vadais, and stop speculating and stop trying to be a chacham and interpret what the Rebbe meant. The Rebbe was very clear about what he meant. And if he wanted to say he was Mashiach, he was not bashful. He would have said it. He didn't say it. And now, the Rebbe said, I've done everything I could, now it's up to you. At the time, we had no idea what he was talking about. But now, now who is it up to? Maybe that's what he meant. Maybe he meant there's going to come a time when you're going to have to do it on your own. Maybe. But that's speculation. The fact is, what is for sure, is that we have to do it. Whether that's what he meant, I don't know. I don't write commentary on the Rebbe's Sichas. So let's, let's stick to what's for sure. If you bring another Jew to study Hasidus, you've done the right thing. Yeah. to understand whether the Rebbe said he was Mashiach. Uh, so I want to turn the question around. Given that there was so much hope, as you said, that it was open, it looked likely, given that it was clear that many people thought or expected or would come to expect, why did the Rebbe not clearly say, just get up and say to the world, I am not uh, not Mashiach, period. And in, in that case, eliminate all our doubts also, I'm trying to understand exactly what you're saying, because I've heard you say two things. Well, one is that it wasn't. The machine isn't or doesn't appear. And the other is that it's a tactical error to think so, because it distances people from Pacific. Get closer to the mic. That it's a tactical error to suggest so publicly, but maybe if it was tactically beneficial, then maybe we should suggest otherwise. But isn't what really matters what the underlying state of affairs is? It's a fair question. Why didn't the Rebbe simply get up and say, I am not Moshiach. If elected, I will not serve. If nominated, I will not run. Um, I don't know. I don't know why the Rebbe did or didn't, but I can tell you this. When President Nixon got up and said, I am not a crook, everyone knew he was a crook. For the Rebbe to get up and say, I am not Moshiach, is, is out of line. Did the Rebbe make it very clear? He made it very clear. There was a magazine that wanted to print an article about the Rebbe being Moshiach. The Rebbe said, if you print it, I'm closing down the magazine. Somebody wanted to give out a book that suggested that the Rebbe is Moshiach. And the Rebbe said, will you stop carrying on a war with me? I told you not to do it. When they sang it, the Rebbe said, I'm going to get up and walk out. Now, the fact that there were times when he didn't object, that doesn't prove anything other than the fact that the Rebbe was a Rebbe. And he wasn't going to become a puppet 
that every time you say this, he's going to say that. Particularly since he said himself, it's not going to help anyway. You've got, you've got it into your head that you're going to force me to be Moshiach, and nothing I say. If I say no, you'll just try harder. So the Rebbe was not going to be played with. Oh, today he didn't object. Let's sing it again tomorrow. See what happens. Come on. Particularly, not every occasion allowed that kind of conversation. For example, if the Fabrengen was on, on television or even broadcast on radio, the devil was not going to raise the issue. On Shabbos, when there's no microphone, the devil would scream about it. But not every Shabbos, because some Shabbosim, they were guests who didn't need to get involved in this. So the devil would not say it. So just for practical reasons. Now, the fact that the Rebbe said it, it distances people from chassidus, that shows how the Rebbe could not even, in concept, relate to himself being Moshiach, even to the degree of saying, I'm not. So his objection was, not I am or I'm not. His objection was, is this good for Judaism or is this bad for Judaism? And it's bad for Judaism. That makes sense? Yes, That's horrible. So when we see where it's leading, when we see that a certain idea is causing hatred, it's causing fights, it's causing neglect of the Rebbe, it's causing violation of the Rebbe's instructions, something's wrong. Thank you very much. Agatanach. When I was telling people Mashiach is coming, somebody said to me, you know, if he doesn't come, I'm going to be very upset. I said, if he doesn't come, you better be upset, but not at me. <laughs> he doesn't come. You're angry at me? We have to be angry at him. He's late. So the solution to all of this is he should come already and stop making trouble. He's supposed to redeem us. <laughs> I get the Thank you. I appreciate it.